Thank you very much. Uh, um, I, I start uh, apologizing for two things. The first one, I didn't prepare a speech because uh, uh, it would be impossible to read this. No, uh, looks not very serious when we speak, uh, come to speak uh, for a college, for a university. And second, about my English, it's not a very good English. I ask you to pay a little bit of attention. And sometimes I'll be put in words that are not English. I'll be adapted then a little bit. I remember a few years ago when Lelia, my, my wife, uh, we were doing this project together. She does all my uh, design, all my books, all the shows. She was learning English with a teacher. And I asked this teacher if it was possible to me to learn English also. And he tells Sebastian, you don't need it because you speak a perfect bad English. And uh, this, <laughs> this uh, I probably speak fluently, but it's special, special English, no? And um, I, I'm very happy to have this show here in the Berkeley Museum. It's a museum linked with this uh, university. Because these pictures that we were show in this uh, exhibition are a little bit a cross-section of uh, our life, life of all us, you know? Now we were in a small reception in the museum, and I was looking, a few migrant workers there, you now serving, working, and I met many of these people crossing the borders, the border between uh, Guatemala and Mexico, coming from South America, from Central America, and uh, jumping the trains, doing about uh, 3,000 miles to arrive here in this country, hanging the trains, very dangerous way. A lot of groups that uh, was bandits that uh, were living here in Los Angeles, police pushed push them out back to Salvador. It was a group of small mafias named uh, Mara Salvatrucha. And they are specialized to jump in these trains and to stolen the migrants, to get the small money. And uh, these guys get a big risk. To do what? To come to this country just to work. And uh, I was once with a group of these, these migrants. He stopped in a town in Oaxaca, in Mexico, waiting on another train to jump in. And uh, the guys, we had 14 years old, the kids. 16, 19, all the ones were 22, 23 years old. And I asked them, but guys, why are you going to the United States? What are you expecting there? And they said, well, we can have a, a work, probably work uh, seven days a week. And who knows, one month uh, we can have some rest. And one day, made our girlfriend come and uh, buy a used car and uh, get some rest, get a small house. And I imagine that's the minimum that ever human being must have. That's the minimum. These guys were looking just for their dignity, just to get another equilibrium in their life, you know? And today when I meet people here, I must respect them a lot because it was so hard for them to reach this land here. I met so many people across the border between Africa and Europe, in Gibraltar, you know, in the boats, taking huge risk of their life to be in Europe just to get a job. And uh, when we imagine why that's happening, in the scale that that is happening in the planet today, of course, migration always exists, but not in the level that's happening now. Do you know, my country, Brazil, in 30 years, we came from 80% of a rural population, today about 80% of urban population. You put about 200, 300 years to become urban. We put 30 years. Mexico, in the same number of years, about 30 years, came from 92% of a rural population today, of close to 75% of urban population. But when we speak migration, mostly the biggest migration is from inside the country to the towns in the third world countries. And why that's happened? And that's the question that we might raise. That did not just happen like this, because that must happen. There is something that happens to provoke all this displacement of population. And that's a point. Before to do this work, I shoot another story named, was called here in this count, Workers. I did a story, a kind of homage to the working class uh, around the world. We did a book that came out named Works. We had a show that toured in this country. And 
I came for uh, economy, as uh, uh, Candice uh, uh, tell to you. Uh, I made the studies in economy. I was militant in leftist parts in Brazil, in France, with Lely. And uh, when I was skilled in photography, one day I take the decision to do a whole major to this working class. That was the center of my studies when I were an economist. And I went around this planet to photograph works because I feel that we are in the end of the first big industrial revolution. And uh, with the arrival of the new technologies in the production, with uh, the new needs of consumption, these intelligent machines in the line of production, something was changed. And uh, turn around this planet, I started to see that a much bigger revolution was going on. It's the whole society in this planet was going to a big change. Because uh, what we call now globalization, was happening after a very long time. Now it's materialized, it's there. We say uh, 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 globalization. But globalization is a system that we put in place after a long time. We change the scale of value of the goods produced here in the north part of the planet. The planes, the computers, the high technology products, they have a price, a very inflated price. The price is very high. And the prices of the goods produced in the south part of this planet, they have another price, and a price that's going down and down. In the end, globalization, I understand in all these years, that is a fabulous, incredible system that we create to transfer health from one part of the planet to the other. It's not that you work most than the others, not the French work more than the others. That's not true. Shooting. Workers, I went to Rwanda, for example, in Africa, and I saw these guys working hard, working 12 hours a day to produce. They produce a lot, they work a lot, and they can buy what with their product? They can buy few clothes, bad clothes. They cannot buy shoes, they cannot buy health, they cannot buy house, they cannot buy car, they cannot buy education, but they work as much as us. And when they export that product, they export a negative price. They pay us to consume their products. And uh, when you go to Sierra Leone, when you go to Ivory Coast to see these guys produce cocoa that we use to consume here, chocolate, the guys producing coffee is exactly the same behavior. The people that fix the price down there, they don't live there. They never produce one gram, one pound of coffee, of cocoa, of tea. This, pr this price is fixed in London, is fixed in New York, is fixed in Chicago, and these prices keep going down. And this price from here keep going up. And these people that I met in the road, that I photograph in the road, that the pictures are here, most of them, they didn't say and don't understand why they lose their house, why they lose their job, and some of them lose their house on the last break why so many wars was going on, they didn't understand. They were just in the road, look for another point of equilibrium in their life, because they were living in equilibrium. They, have a, they had a house, they had a job, they have their dignity, they have their kids, poor, but they had. And now they have nothing. They are getting another point. These kids that I met in the train coming here, they were just looking how to defend their dignity, how to defend their way of life. No, they are come just for work. 99% of the people that arrive in this country is to work, is to produce. No? And the guys that come to France is the same. And my friends, that's globalization. When we speak globalization here in the side of the planet, we understand the globalization is globalization of finance, is globalization of economy, is globalization of information, is globalization of uh, any kind of thing that we want. But we never speak about globalized people. Globalized people don't interest, no? It's a figure. But that's not true, no? We must mind about the others. My country, Brazil, we had no habit to produce orange. Brazilians don't consume orange, never. We never consume orange. Orange juice for us don't mean nothing. In a few years, Brazil become the first producer of orange on the planet. For what? For this country here. 
No? When we had orange produced mostly in Florida, and we had cold weather come from the north, they killed very quick these orange trees. And it was necessary to guarantee some orange trees for this market. Where we went, we went for the state in Sao Paulo of Brazil. We get the land where we are producing rice, produce beans, produce potatoes, produce all that was necessary to, to the Brazilian people to eat. Producing small farms, because this was a region of big colonization of Italian, Japanese people. And big companies came, they bought the land, they paid the, the, the market price. But Brazil had a huge inflation system. The guys that sell a farm, they put the money beside, six months with the money that they sell a farm, it was impossible for them to buy a bicycle. And uh, shooting workers, I went to this farm and produce orange, produce sugar cane, to do sugar, Brazil became the biggest export of sugar, to do soya beans, Brazil is the second biggest producer of soya beans in this planet, we don't consume soya beans. Its products go inside a logical, an international logical, a global logical, it's not a Brazilian logical. And what happens? These farmers produce a lot, they bought the land, we have millions of uh, small farmers that was pushed outside of their land. They went for the towns not far away. Small towns in very few years become huge towns. And when these farms need uh, work, they send a truck, they made an agreement, contract per day, they employ people per day. When they have no more job, they don't send more trucks. And we create in Brazil what we call boyas frias. Boya means food, fria means cold. It's the guys that eat cold. It's a class that uh, uh, sociologists, anthropologists, doing studies now, have the impression that always exists in Brazil. That's a lie. 30 years ago, that didn't exist in Brazil. That's a product of globalization. And uh, it's incredible. Because uh, now I was shooting workers. I met a lot of guys who work in their own land that they lose for these big farms. No? And orange juice keep, keep coming. When you drink uh, orange juice, we don't put the question. But we must raise the question. Because in the end, all the health that we have accumulated in this country is the health all elsewhere around this planet. And if you want, in a sense, live together, if you want to uh, be in a society that's a society for all, we must get a way to have this back, in a sense. Because uh, these migrants that come here, they will not come if they have a job in their home. If they have a house in their home, they have a way of life. They don't have more way of life. In Africa, it's exactly the same. And uh, we are working, our Kent said, in a project in Brazil. When I was born there, no? and uh, when I was a kid, more than half of this farm was rainforest, with crocodiles in the rivers, with monkeys, with 35 families working in this farm, producing any kind of uh, products. We are living in an equilibrated society. Poor society, but equilibrated. People are not that unhappy. And uh, slowly by slowly, we cut the forest to do logging, to do coal, and mostly to put grass in place to produce meat. The United States has 93 million head of cattle. Brazil has 170 million heads of cattle. We have more cattle than we have population in Brazil. Brazil cannot consume all this meat. This meat is for export is for foreign market. Now with the store of trade uh, uh, cow in, uh, in uh, Europe, uh, Brazil was putting this meat there. We guarantee this place in the market, you know? And that is the point. It's not that I'm tell that we can come back in globalization. For me, it looks very difficult to come back in globalization. But probably we can do a much more human globalization. We can mind, mind in a different way when you imagine how we waste resource in rich countries like this, I don't let's say only United States, but the rich countries, you see the new bombers that you have here, the B1s, the B2s, is the plane of $200 million. One tractor for agriculture costs about $20,000. With one plane like this, we can buy probably 10,000 tractors. My friends, with 10,000 tractors, we can do a huge agricultural revolution in many countries around this planet, just with one plane. 
This forest that we are trying to plant in Brazil is very tough for us to get resources to put back this forest. We are planting about 1.5 million trees. We are creating environmental school. We have not enough resource for this. We are fighting. We get small money here and that. And finally, in the few years that we are working, we arrived to get our community with us in Brazil. Our municipality came inside the project. They are putting 10% of their budget now in order to uh, rebuild the forest because we have no more water. All these small rivers that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, had crocodile on them, today have no more water. Because uh, we cut the forest, we cannot more retain the water during the rain season, and big erosion killed these small rivers. And now my municipality voted this. They hope uh, in uh, 30 years, with the money that they are putting, they are put 10% of their budget, they are mined probably do about uh, $20 million in 30 years. We are fighting with a lot of different institutions to get funders in order to multiply by three this amount of money. That means about $50, $60 million. In 30 years, we can be planting about 60 to 70 million trees. We do a green revolution. I mean, assure you that we do a green revolution. We change completely the face of the planet down there. My guys, this is one quarter of one bomber that you are producing for hundreds in this country. No, we just vote now in the end of October, the new fighter that this country will be producing is a contract for $400 billion. $200 billion will be for this country, and $200 billion will be for England, Denmark, Spain, Turkish. And we are not speaking about uh, the complement for this planes how this plane will be flying distant, how many different tanks we punt, the weapons that we're going, probably we are speaking about $700 billion. When you imagine this new program of Star Wars that is going to be started, how many billion dollars we're going to use? But for what? In 30 years, this will be obsolete. It will be necessary to rebuild again. This plane is in 20 years, we'll be having a new plane because these planes are just replacing the F-16, the F-15, all these planes that are very expensive. The others, what do you do with them? We break them, we destroy them. And these are our resources that are supposed to build another planet that we can live well inside. But what are we doing? And we can point by finger like this, the American government, but the American government is our it's all us that are inside this room. It's all us that are in these streets. Because these guys that are there, we let all them. We vote on them. And that's the point. How we can live in another society that uh, we be a society for all. How we can live in a planet that can have our trees back. How we can live in a planet with ever community around this planet. Can live with dignity. We can respect the culture of these people. And after a few years, we forget that there is culture in Africa. We speak all about starvation in Africa. You remember people of my age, I just completed 58 years a few days ago. We remember when we were kids, the folklore that were around Africa, with the jungle, with the animals, with the culture, with the dance. We speak all about starvation in Africa. We speak all about the wars in Africa. But what planet we built? Is this, is for this that we work? It's for this that we elevate our kids. It's not for this. Something is wrong. And I hope that the speakers that are there can add a little bit to provoke a debate. I know that the speakers are learning nothing. But the speakers with humanitarian organizations, with the newspapers, with the information, with the students, all together, we can probably build a new society. And the question is how to do this. And for me, if I... Someone put the question for me, is with a dialogue. We must go open our mind and go to a discussion. But start to discuss with our neighbor, with our street, with our community, and made have indications, elect the people that are responsible people that are in compatibility with our ideas. No? It's not that sometimes people say, oh, the people's reactionary. The people don't want new ideas. The people want new ideas. The only difference is that you don't discuss with the people. What you give for the people is nothing than consumption, than violence, when all these things. And probably we can give another thing. 
We can do another proposition and probably create another society. I tell you, when I finished to photograph the first chapter of this story, because for me this story has two chapters. One chapter was workers that I did before, and second was migration. When I finished to photograph workers, I was very proud about humanity because I work in factors of shipwrecks, in factors of cars, in big miners. I was so moved by how the humans are capable to transform all around them. It's an animal made to transform goods. It's incredible to see how we can produce a ship. We get a flat steel. No, we had a square steel that's produced in a, in a steel plant that come from a mine as cooking coal, as uh, 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 iron ore. We transform this in flat steel that go for, for a, a, a shipyard. And this is small men inside the shipyard when you see the size of the ship. They are capable to put all this together. They tighten this slice by slice. In six months, one year, two years, we have an incredible ship that could turn around this planet, get shirts from Bangladesh to bring to the guys here in San Francisco to consume. No? These shirts that are shirts that were made with a textile that came from India and, uh, and transformed there in, in, uh, in uh, the, the fibers that come from India, transformed te textile that go to Philippines to make shirts to bring here. It's incredible how we are sophisticated to produce. No? And I'm sh when I assure you, when I was come out of this, I was 100% sure that humanity was in evolution. And for me, evolution was the positive sense of the inclination of the curve. But now that I finished to photograph migration, that picture there, I see that evolution can be in any direction of this curve. We are going down, we are going against the wall, we are going to the death, but also we are evoluting. That's evolution also. And what's incredible, what I saw when I was shooting this, is the capacity of adaptation that we have. We adapted to any kind of situation. When I came to photograph the refugee camps of people come out of Rwanda, it was incredible. I was saw one day uh, thousands of dead people, a mountain of dead people, probably 10,000, 15,000 of dead people. It was so many death. So many dead people that was not possible to bear one by one. It was necessary to have a bulldozer, do a huge row in the ground, and have this huge machine get a hundred bodies at a time and put there inside. Total degradation. And I saw a man come with a kid, speak one with a friend beside, discussing, came with this kid, the dead kid, and threw over all these thousands of dead. He went, I came, I ran to Rina and said to him, I said, oh man, who was this kid? I said, my son that died this night, he just put it, he just went. He was completely adapted to the death. And I tell you, this violence that we live in this planet today, the violence in my country 30, 30 years ago didn't exist. Now we are on the most violent country in this planet. We are completely made to it, completely adapted. And when I came out of this, now I, I'm not sure more if you will survive as a specimen. I have a big doubt that you can survive as a specimen. If we understand, that, for me, it's a point of view, if you understand two things, solidarity and community. If you have real one idea of solidarity and a real idea of community, probably we can survive. The contrary, probably we disappear. Probably we disappear. And when you see animals much more strong than us that live about 100 million years ago as dinosaurs, they live for how many millions of years? Or 100 millions of years? 150 millions of years? And they're gone. And uh, probably if you don't pay attention, probably we can go us. We can go us. And uh, I, I believe that is this. When, when I was in the road photographing the people, these people all then had a common point. They had just one common point all then, is the hope of survival, the instinct of survival. And if, if I must tell that there is a God for us humans, is our instinct of survive, is our instinct of protection of our specimen. You know, I believe that's in this sense that probably we must act, we must work together to protect ourselves. And uh, I believe that we cannot protect only the Americans, only the French. 
We must protect all of us together. The contrary, you cannot survive alone. We must survive all together. Thank you very much, please. That's a pretty bleak view of things. Uh, and I'm kind of curious to know what, what keeps you going? You know, uh, it's, it's always my life, you know, for where I come from. I born in a small town. I, I born in a farm. And I came to a small town when I was four or five years old with my family. I have seven sisters. and. Uh, after a moment, it was necessary to go to one town, a little bit bigger than there, because we have just a first uh, part of a secondary school in my town, my small town in Brazil. I went to study and to work in a big town, that's Vitoria, that's the capital of province. From there, I met Lelia, we became married. I, I made a license uh, uh, a college in economy. I went to Sao Paulo, to a big town. After we mixed in this, movements against the dictatorship in Brazil were pushed out of Brazil. Today, 30 years late, we live in France, we live in Brazil, but most of the time we live in France, and uh, we came from refugees to migrants, and I'm yet a foreign, live in a foreign country. That always, I was inside this, uh, this, this behavior of life, you know? And that become a way of life, and uh, I have a big hope that uh, we, we get together a solution because, uh, you know, I don't work alone. When you see pictures, we have a, a horrible way to, to, to make the photographer a kind of a vedette, you know, a kind of a, a heroic person because we have just the name of the photographer there. But you don't work alone. To the pictures to be there. We have a team. I work with Leila that sits there. We work uh, with a group of, uh, of people that are in laboratory, Ted, to edit. We work with a big number of humanitarian organizations that use this picture. I was here in San Francisco now in, uh, in October, not in San Francisco, I apologize, in Auckland, just beside here, in October, with a meeting that the Tides Foundation organized with uh, Progressist Foundation in the United States, show pictures, participate in debates, and uh, that means we are not alone. We will work sometime with friends. I have here David Harris that sits there, that we did many stories together. I was sitting there in France, working around the world. I met David in, in, uh, in north of Iraq. I met David in, uh, in uh, Brazil. We did many stories together. That means you are not alone. We are a kind of a group, big group, and, uh, and uh, it's trying to, to, to bring this debate, try to discuss. We are working on this environmental project in Brazil. We are probably the biggest employer of Maitau. We are employing 92 people. You know? We have a group. We have uh, Lel and myself who go around the world speaking and begging money for the people to give a little bit, that we must plant the trees. That is our function. But we have the guys there planting. We have the guys there, bi biologists, uh, taking care of the, the, the ecosystem, uh, doing monitoring to see if we are going to go direct. That means you are not alone. That's the point. That make you go. You know? That will make you get power to go again. And uh, the and, uh, situation is not easy, but we have a big hope. I believe that's the hope is the, is the fuel that we made you go. Do you, do you think in the last 10 years, 15 years, you become less hopeful or more hopeful? I become less hopeful. I become less hopeful in the sense that uh, I travel a lot. I probably went for more than a hundred different counts on this planet, and many times for the same country. And uh, there is very few countries in the third world that the second trip, the situation is better than the, bef uh, the trip before. That the third trip is better than the second trip. That the fourth trip is each time 
more degradate, more hard the situation. No? Have you, and do you ever think of just giving up? No, I'm not giving up. No one is giving up. And uh, I tell you, I worked for seven years shooting these pictures. The people that I, made, that I met in the road, they were distressed, but they were, they, they were not depressed. No one was inside a depression by the situation. They were having a big hope, a big energy to get a new equilibrium point. That gives you a lot of hope, a lot of espoir, no? But uh, it's, it's very complicated. We're just coming back from Mexico City. When you see what we built in Mexico City, what the size of this town. I was remember with Graciela Turbide, that's a photographer friend of us that were having a show together. Uh, in 98, I came to do a story of peasants in Mexico. I went to Oaxaca to shoot a, a group, an ethnical group named the Mijas. Incredible people. These Mijas, they were music musicians. And the guys in this Mijas society that was supposed to play an instrument or to sing was not necessary to work in a hard work. That was his work. And they had incredible parts, incredible music. In 1998, I came back to Mexico to work with the Zapatista movement, to work with migrants crossing this country, and uh, doing a story in Mexico City. I went to the, the Mihi country. There is no more Mihi country. They immigrate. They abandon the land. And uh, I met them in the periphery of Mexico City. They are urbans now. No? When you see these things, you say, my God, what is the world? We did a book of landless movement in Brazil, a book named The Terra that we can find in this country because it was published by, in England by Fidon, but it's distributed here. We had a lot of shows uh, that Lely designed, a kit of poster that we made, a lot of shows around the world, and uh, in Brazil. And uh, let landless movement is fighting very hard for the peasants to have land, to be fixed, to create cooperatives, fighting for these Brazilians become citizens because they are same not citizens yet. In discussing with the guys of the direction of the landless movement, they tell me that they probably were losing the fight because we are fixing about 50,000 families a year, 70,000 families maximum, and you have more than 200,000 families per year that abandon the fields going to the towns. No? And it's the system, it's the model. No? But it, do, you, do you think it's really a system or is it just sort of happening out of control? I mean, at the heart of this whole proposition is the question of globalization. Now, I, if you analyze that, how do you, good, bad, can it work, is it hopeless? What's the I, alternative? I, I don't believe that the things happen just because they happen. It's not, they, there is not, they are not, uh, we live not in a factual world. We live in a world where we, we, we made, uh, provoke, uh, uh, changes and that create a big uh, wave of reaction in the other side. I was looking another day in Europe. Uh, just uh, about one and a half year ago, we changed the composition of the chocolate in Europe. In order to consume more uh, uh, fat material from European uh, agriculture that's completely protected by the states in Europe, and they allowed them to consume 5% of other fatty material than chocolate inside the production of the chocolate. And uh, that's very well for Nestlé, that's produced a little bit more cheap and made a big profit. Their, their stocks go very high in, uh, in Dow Jones, no way that goes, and uh, because they will be doing profit. But in Ivory Coast, in Sierra Leone, that will be provoking millions of unemployment, of job. And for me, all this is very tight. Of course, that the local, uh, uh, governors, that the politicians local, they have a big, big culpability. There is a lot of local problems that have a, that you must get a, a, a solution also. But uh, we are acting in a global order that uh, is not profiting the majority of the people. And I believe that we must look inside the, 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 the full model we are not working. You see, when I was shooting workers, I went for a small factory inside Bangladesh. This small factory inside Bangladesh is not producing more for Bangladesh. It's importing globally, it's producing globally. We are living in a system that's completely integrated today. Same if you, my country, we have the workers' part that has a possibility to get the power in next elections, 
in the end of this year. But Lula, that's probably the next president of Brazil, I hope so, he probably will be impossible to take Brazil outside that system. If he takes Brazil outside that system, Brazil don't exist more. He probably must hold it inside that system. It's impossible, no? And uh, how we can do? No. Well, that's the question I want to ask you. Uh, I mean, you no, know, this question is not to me. Me, I'm just a vector. I'm just going to see. I bring it here to show. I try to provoke a debate. This question is to put to the, the sociologists that are here inside, the anthropologists. This is a fabulous college, probably one of the best universities of this planet. You probably know where we are going, no? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> No, that, that's, that's the reality, you know, and, uh, and uh, my God, I turn all this, I constant, I, I try to link what I'm seeing to give uh, people to see what's going on and uh, to, to add it to provoke this discussion. Working, I tell you, with the most big sincerity inside my heart, but uh, I, I, I have no solution. I don't know what is the solution. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I believe that we must be together to get the solution. Me, with you, with all people in the streets, all around. We must go to a debate. We must go to a discussion. And probably the solution will be not down in Brazil, will be not down in Africa. Probably the solution is just here. That we must, if probably, we'll be living another way. We can behave in another way. We can be le less egoist. Less, so probably, probably we become to have a solution for all this. And there is a point today in society that we live. We were in discussion this morning in the School of Journalism. And I forget to speak one thing about the students. It's about the big cynicism that we live in the society that we are today. Now, it's a cynical society. And more cynical is mostly, for example, in the press. No, better is the journalist. I remember I have this show that's here. And we had this show in New York in June, September. And I had a critic in the New York Times, the art critic that criticized my work, in the end, made a resume of his critic. He told that, that me, I was not enough cynic. That, that's, that's a big problem, no? Well, and that's he also said your problem. photographs were too, almost too beautiful. They were almost too beautiful, but when they do the comparison with the, the, uh, the American photographer, what his name, uh, uh, Walker Evans, in the end, uh, he recognized that uh, uh, Walker Evans has a kind of cynicism, and it was necessary to me to have a little bit of cynicism more inside my pictures. No? And this, this is a big problem in the society that we live you know? I work with many journalists, and uh, they are basically cynic. You know? and, uh, and it's, it's, it's terrible, the society that we are living today. If, if we eliminate this a little bit, you know? if we eliminate a little bit of the huge pretension that we have, probably we can live in a better world. I don't know. You're, you're a real idealist, aren't you? I'm a real what? Idealist. Yes, yeah. I'm an idealist. <laughs> um, I mean, it, 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 it's interesting to hear you, who uh, are one of the best-known photographers in the world, and yet hearing you speak, you would hardly know you're a photographer at all. I mean, you're almost an evangelist for this global dilemma that you find yourself in. It's a rather striking uh, uh, comment. Well, yeah. we can speak about photography. It's not a problem. But, uh, <laughs> no, I want yeah. <laughs> um, But do you know, uh, this, we, we are speaking this morning. Uh, when I was young in Brazil, people of my generation, I'm, I'm sure that inside this room, and most of people did what I did. We tried to learn Esperanto, no? in order to, to learn a language that was supposed to communicate with everyone inside the planet. We had this big illusion that would be possible, and we tried. Enough that disappeared like that. That was not the true. And after we came, English. We said, oh, that's the universal language, the English. No? That, in the end, is an incredible language, but it's more technical language than other thing. And finally, the, the photography, for me, the images, not only photography, photography is the device of the, the moving move image, the photography is a universal language, is a very powerful language. What you write in this language in Africa, we can read here with no translation. What you write in, in, in India, we can read in China. That's a very powerful language. 
in this sense, uh, I, I use this language. I am a, a writer in this language. I have a passion of photographer. Of course, the, the first motivation that made me be, go there, the reason is photography. I love photography. It's a pleasure to be close to the people, to approach, approach them with a camera, and the people allowed you to come inside their life. They tell you their stories, and uh, they accept you, and uh, it's fabulous, because uh, I don't pose no one. I don't organize no one to do a picture. But uh, when we, we come with a camera, people act for your camera. People accept you, and we, you come inside the environment. I work mostly alone, and when you come alone, you are accepted. We are an animal made to live in, in community, made to live in group, and uh, you are accepted. And from this moment, uh, the integration is very hard, but, uh, very, very strong. But uh, this is photography. No, I must uh, write with this language that is a deeply static language because we work in a formal, in a formal. It's a formal language. That means it must be statical, necessarily. Any photographer that is inside that write in this language, they, they write in a formal language that is statical. But uh, it's very powerful at the same time. It's very powerful. We have uh, this possibility to approach people, to live with people, to freeze this moment, and there's a fraction of a second. If I get an average of all these pictures that are inside this show, we have about uh, 300 pictures. One, th one uh, over 300 of a second each one, all together probably made one second of picture there. It's very fast, but it's very powerful at the same time. Look in these pictures, you understand the story of these people. We understand the distress of the society that we are living. We stand a little bit of aesthetics. We, we understand a little bit of the photography. It's a pleasure to be a photographer. It's an incredible pleasure to be a photographer. And, uh, I can shoot from the morning to the evening. I can integrate. But uh, do you know, these are not objects in a sense that uh, I made in this show and we speak about my photography, how I made the composition, how the static is this, how the light is there. I cannot because these pictures like they are hanging here, they are not objects. They are a history. And I'm speaking in these pictures about our history. And uh, for me, it was difficult to come here speak about own photography. It was necessary to be the society that we are living, from where these pictures come from, where I made my way of life. I live like this. How, how do you view America? <laughs> I mean, this global society that we are evolving into, uh, the United States figures very prominently. What, when you look at America, what do you see? And, what would you say to our president if you uh, were asked to uh, <laughs> say a few words? Well, <laughs> you know, uh, it's the it's, it's same for me, inimaginable to say something for the president of the United States. Not that there will be not access to him, but uh, how can we speak? to a person that uh, represents an incredible machine, an incredible system, is a system. And I'm not, I'm not sure if you say something for the President of the United States, this President is capable to change something. He represents so many things back to him. No? There is so many power, military power, industrial power, interest, uh, economic interest on this that probably a president is just the, the, the point of iceberg of a system. No, tell something to him is an imagination, but probably go to tell something for the American uh, Chamber of Representatives would be incredible. No, because in the end are these guys that represent all one that are here. No, and, uh, and uh, in this moment, uh, there is so many things to say. So many things to discuss, you know, so many evident things. And, uh, but the machine that we built, this monster that we built, how to come back, how to uh, 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 go back in a, in a system. When you see what happens in this country in the 11th of September, you no, know, it was a terrible, terrible. 
to see, sit in television and see these planes kind of against these buildings, see the firing going on in these buildings, and see the humans is more like it is in this window, in this window of this building. No way to take these people out. This so powerful country, so incredible technology, they had not a way to go to take out these small humans that was there. And so these people jump in the empty space. Desperate, that's this, this total desperation. No? And uh, see this happen, I came inside my head to say something will be happening in this country. We go to another dialogue in this planet. I'm sure that we must go. Because we understand now that uh, this country was rich, badly rich, rich in these two buildings that represent all the transfer of the health of all the planet, because it's this, the financial, they hit the financial system. And uh, I say, we go to another discussion, because it's about this, we must open the dialogue. But what happens? We, when you saw the speech of the president of this country, was one speech of vengeance, of war, we went for bombing, we very quickly, we destroy the, the, the system in Afghanistan. And what happens after this? No dialogue. We have the impression that, uh, that these guys had much more reason that they, they to, to employ the power than to go to a debate. And now we are speaking about what? To go to bomb Iraq, to go to bomb, uh, we made a big provocation against Iran a few days ago. And, uh, and uh, we are not going to dialogue. We are going to more military uh, uh, situation. We are going for more provocation that necessarily we become more distressed inside this country, a medium, a medium in long term, you know? And we are not going to a solution. And it, it, that's, that's so evident, looking to this, that uh, how, what reason that we have to go to say something to these people? They know this. They are smart people. They have a lot of, uh, of uh, counselors, a lot of people tell this to them. This country has so many economists, so many sociologists, so many anthropologists that I'm sure 100% that are telling this to them. But these guys have capacity or have not capacity to stretch back to another kind of land. When you see the number of, uh, of um, the budgets that were voted after the 11th of September, and uh, you saw when this plane hit these buildings, the Dow Jones were not too high. The, the NASDAQ was one of the most low levels. That means that came just a little bit down and came back again for the same level. And the uh, American economy was going inside a depression. And now, after the 11th of uh, September, we started to reinvest in this country massively. This new plane, I spoke a few minutes ago, the first agreement, $400 billion. That go much more than this. We have the Star Wars system that's going inside. We have the, 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 the military system that are getting more and more power. That means the public investment is going very, very strong inside of this country. You see the deficit, the public deficit in the United States now was not in deficit, now it is. It's going investment inside the military a direction. That means the countries begin to come out of the recession, but uh, the economy is not the same anymore. No? These guys that hold the military industries, they are not uh, people mind about ecology. They are not people mind about distribution of health around the planet. But do you think photos and might have the power to make people what are they? see? Do you think f your photographs? No, I'm not speaking about my poor photographs. Well, let's just say photographs I, I in don't, general. I don't believe that they have uh, power. For they know the photographs alone are nothing. They are nothing. Mm -hmm. The photographs. I'm just but grappling here to know how. how what, what, what's the what's the answer? That, what's the answer? That's the question. What's the answer? <laughs> no. I don't have the answer. No? Um, because, uh, do you know, the photographs, as I said a few minutes ago, they must be mixed with many things. They are just one element inside the full debate. They are be bring a small element inside the full debate. They are not a reply. They are more a question than a reply. 
Well, maybe uh, there are many questions here. Uh, I have many more, but I'd love to get to some questions from you. So why don't we, uh, if we, can the lights come up just a little so we can see out there and, and have some questions? Uh, are there mics in the audience or? All right, let's start without you right there. Try to keep your questions short and clear. You know, these projects, you need to organize it then uh, long term that they can work. And uh, you, you need first build a project. You must do a research in order to organize this. I had a big chance to be an economist before to be a photographer. And I work in an investment, investment bank for a while that was the diversification fund of international coffee organization. I did uh, a PhD in economics at the University of Paris and went to work in this investment center. And uh, after resigning from there, it was long-term investment project, economic development, because coffee was in overproduction at that time and was necessary to do a diversification of, uh, of coffee production. It's like this that I did my first trips in Rwanda, Burundi, Zaire, in many different counties of Africa. And each producer count of coffee was necessary to put one dollar for each bag that they export of coffee, and the importers put one dollar. We create a fund of diversification. Thing. And I learned to do projects. I learned to do calculate costs of things. And when I organized this project, I went for about 14 different magazines around the world. Here in the United States, I started working with a New York Times magazine in Rolling Stone until the end, and uh, with Stern magazine in Germany, Paris March in France, El País in Spain, for many different, Folha de São Paulo in Brazil. We shared the cost of this project with this group of magazines. And we went, we created a base, a group in Paris, to do the research, to get authorization, to get authorization to, to get the, the clearance to go inside the countries, to, to add me on this. And we went to do these stories. And uh, we gave four magazines during a, uh, an average of five, six stories per year. And the magazines published, and against this space, they financed the, the, all, the, all the work. You know? And uh, that took me about seven years to do. I'm just finished another story now. I shoot a story on polio, poliomyelitis. I did a story now for about uh, one year with uh, UNICEF and World Health Organization. Because you know, this country here was badly hit by polio about uh, 40, 50 years ago. And now the new generation, same don't know that polio was real uh, a ghost in this country, as AIDS is today, probably more strong yet. But that finished here, and last finished in all America after about all 20 years ago. But polio keep going in other countries as Zaire, as Congo, as Somalia, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, the countries where you have conflicts, and it uh, was impossible to inoculate kids there. And for this also, it was necessary to go to the magazines again, and I have in this country now Vanity Fair that will be doing 32 pages now in, uh, in the, um, April in polio, and uh, we'll be, we're applying for funds for UNICEF, we had the Stern in German, Paris Mat, this group of magazines. The, the, the pictures that are here, the first support of these pictures, the first place are the magazines and humanitarian organizations, and after they become uh, shows, they become any kind of things, you know? It's more like that, that was okay. Uh, how do you think the media is doing these days in covering the whole question of globalization? Well, they are glo covering. It's, the, 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 there is so many deb debates in, uh, in the media. I believe that they are covering the, 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 the question of globalization. I believe that this big debate is going on, but uh, you know, uh, we, we, we become to work today a kind of monopoly of media, you know? And uh, sometimes you see, you have a system of uh, television where most people are looking today, and uh, they are very compromised inside the kind of information. You see how the big, big, uh, 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 television groups in America 
show the problem of uh, the after the 11th of September, no? how that was tight. In a moment, we, we, we didn't know what was opinion of American government, what was CNN that was going so mixed up of this. No? And for me, the problem is to, he, to have independent media, how we, with independent media does. No? But uh, I believe that we have a quite a good coverage. We had uh, now these meetings in Porto Alegre, uh, that is foreign social forum that happens in Porto Alegre about uh, one week, 10 days ago. Here in this country, I don't know because I just come in, but in Europe we have a very nice coverage of this, a very nice debate that was provoked. I think it was a, a lot less here. Uh, let's have another question on the floor. How about right here? Do you know, uh, there is a group of photographers in this country, documentary photographers in this country that work very hard on this, and that they show the American reality to us. You know, it's very difficult for a photographer to cover all. I'm trying to put my life to do these two projects. You know, this project, in the end, the two chapters, that is workers, and that is migration. That took me 15 years to do the two. And, uh, and this is a big, big, big part, prob probably half of my life of photographer, to do these two stories. And uh, we work here in San Francisco with, uh, with Ken Light, Kerr Treman, and, uh, and uh, other friends here in order to, to, to give, give grants for photographers, for documentary photographers with Mother Journals Documentary Fund. And uh, that works for a while. That works quite well. We had a lot of photographers from elsewhere around the world, same from the United States. That was necessary. But do you know there is a big tradition of documentary photographs in this country, and that work work very, very well, very hard. And uh, for me, it was necessary to show these pictures here also. Because do you know, we have eight shows like this, exactly eight shows. We are touring the shows elsewhere around the world that goes to south part of the planet that come from the north. We have shows in Brazil, we have shows in Argentina, we had, have shows going now to China, to India, to many different places. We built about uh, 3,000 small shows, kit of posters. The show that is here is a resume of this that we send for churches, for, uh, document, uh, for uh, humanitarian organizations, for uh, schools. And uh, we create a, a film uh, that will be shown here tomorrow that's turned on television. We have uh, uh, television in France, Canal Plus, that we create 30 films of three minutes each one that television show a lot about uh, this. In the end, uh, we have a, a, a DVD. We create an educational program linked with uh, these, these pictures. And uh, there is so many as different aspects to show this, that the people sometimes come just to look the pictures. Sometimes we create educational programs. It's the kids that are having these pictures to, to use uh, as uh, uh, what's it, matter inside the school. We are trying the best that we can try. It's the same with polio. We try to create, create an, a system of uh, shows that can go to every school. We're creating a big internet uh, uh, site with polio and to see how can we reach, you know? And Lelia, that uh, my wife that's here, that we work together, we keep in China the way that we can make these pictures the most popular possible in the sense that every person can look at them can participate, can, uh, can come inside the debate, you know? And, uh, but it is not easy because uh, we come from a very traditional way to show photography, you know? And uh, uh, we try to bring this inside the galleries, inside the, any kind of place that was possible to bring. We try to bring these pictures. And, uh, and that, that's the point. But I believe that there is a lot of research to do to make photography more popular to see if you can bring this more close to the people, no? 
And uh, I believe that's his deploy. This is a credible operation you've launched. It is incredible operation. I mean, Absolutely. it's huge it is. and broadly based. And I mean, it must be extraordinarily taxing for you to keep it fed, keep it going. Do you know that uh, after a month that it goes more or less uh, in alone? Because uh, when you work with many different organizations and that you give for them the pictures, they, they go ahead with the pictures, no? And majority of these shows, very few shows I come, like I come here for an opening, I don't come. This, that's keep going, that's going by their own, no? And the pictures uh, have their own way. But uh, it's not easy because we have a very small group. We are about six person that we created to deal with this. And plus, I must continue to photograph. To, to pay the salaries of these people, no? I do a lot of commercial assignments. I'm going now, we are trying to get an agreement with a soccer team in, in, in Spain, that's Real Madrid, that's complete 100 years, that will be working two and a half, three months for them to, to raise money, that's a commercial work that I must do because uh, with social pictures, it, you cannot alive. We can pay a project like this, the displacement, but uh, that means is is a lot of work. Of course, that's a lot of work, but uh, that's the life. That's like this. Another question. How about right uh, here? Can you all hear the question? Uh, he, she asked what he would say to the comment that documentary photography is dying. I, I don't believe that documentary photography is dying. Uh, do you know, there is one kind of, uh, 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 what's it, uh, supposition, I don't know if this English word, assumption, that uh, with the death, death of a big magazine, such as Life magazine, or Geo magazine that was here that gone all these kind of magazines. Documentary photography or reportage photography is disappeared. But there is so many use, other uh, use of this photography. You see, the number of non-governmental organizations that exist now, 20 years ago, they were not 10% of the numbers that they are now. And most of them, a lot of them have magazines, have publications, have newspapers. And the number of uh, supplement of newspapers Sunday supplement of newspaper that didn't exist 20 years ago. Today, a lot of these magazines, majority of them have a supplement inside. And uh, all these people use photography. You see, uh, internet now, when you have these sites, they use much more photography, they use video. Because when they use video, they use a lot of memories to show the movement inside and they use pictures. And there is a big space for use of pictures, a lot of space. And uh, I see the number of photographers. When, when I went to shoot a few conflicts about 20 years ago, we had much less photographers than we have now. The number of photographers are going, are improving. And uh, I don't believe that uh, documentary photography, photography reportage is dying. There is something change, of course, that's the way that you are photographing, the way that you are doing the, let's say, uh, registration of these pictures. My, me, I am yet in traditional way. These problems die because I'm photographing with uh, a normal film. I must develop it, I must fix it. That means it's a, a complete chemical system to, to have these pictures. But uh, now with uh, this electronic camera, we have this camera, digital cameras, probably, I'm not sure, but probably in a few years, all people will be shooting on this. We are feeling a few problems, for example, to have paper today to print the pictures. And uh, it's, it's a big change going on. But for me, that don't mean that for, for, uh, documentary photography will die. We'll be adapting in a new technical tool and probably be going again. But uh, I, I really don't believe that uh, documentary photography is dying. There is so many guys working on this. There is so many stories. There is so many good photographers doing stories and denounce the situation. And uh, in this country, it's incredible the number of photographers working. No? Let's have a question over here, uh, right there. Uh, 
She asks if you believe your uh, Brazilian nationality is reflected in your photographs. Uh, no, the nationality, no, but my Brazil origin, yes. Because, uh, do you know, uh, as can to tell, I come from a state in Brazil, that state of Minas Gerais, that's probably the most baroque state in Brazil. And uh, when we speak baroque, we speak about uh, uh, Portuguese, we speak about uh, Spain, no? And uh, I come from a completely baroque uh, culture. And of course, that uh, th this has a lot to do in my way to see, in my way to photograph. When you see my photographs, they are very baroque pictures in a sense. I understand this. But this I bring with me. When I go to photograph, I photograph with my region. I photograph uh, with what I saw when I was a kid. I photograph with what I learned. I made my visual universe and my intervention with my past. That means in this moment, uh, be Brazilian means a lot. But, uh, but being Peruvian means the same. Being American uh, means the same. Each one has his origin and the intervention that he does, he does with uh, all his culture inside. But uh, the fact to be Brazilian and to have a Brazilian passport sometimes add me a lot because his account uh, where it has no conflicts, has no problems, has not, uh, is not uh, pointed by finger to be an imperialist account, that, that facilitated the things. But I don't believe that being Brazilian is a privilege or is not a privilege. I, I believe that uh, it's, it's, this is not the important fact. No. We have time for two more questions. Let's take one from over here. Anyone uh, in the back there? Uh, what are you thinking about working on in the future, next project? You know, uh, I just finished this, this story in polio now. I spent about one year. We are preparing all this to come out, uh, that will become for, out for this year. And uh, I'm become older, and uh, I just complete 58 years now. And uh, sometimes it's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not very easy to this place, to carry, to carry all these bags, and uh, to travel in many different, it's very hard at life of a photographer. And, uh, and uh, I begin to have problems in my colon, and I must, uh, in a sense, probably I'll be not working more in big, big projects as work until now. One, one idea that I'm having now is to go a lot inside what I shoot, what I photographed, because when you see uh, the books that I did until now, the stories that I show, was real precise stories. But photographing, and I do so many things beside. Same if I do, for example, I problem the photograph that mostly shoot in Africa, in the history of photography. And I'm planning to do a book about Africa. I have the stories from the, the colonization of Africa until now until the polio that I shoot now a few months ago in Congo, in Somalia, in, in, uh, in uh, Sudan. And I'm planning probably to put these pictures together and do a book about the 30 years of, the last 30 years of Africa. That's my 30 years of photography. And uh, there is many works like this, because I was mind, there is a lot of photographs that after they disappear, we begin to discover a lot of pictures that they never published, unpublished pictures, and the, the unpublished stories. And I want to get the pleasure myself to discover what I did. And uh, <laughs> no, that's true. I was speaking with a friend from here the other day. I travel so much. I display so much that now I want to do a look inside the photography that I did and uh, put this together and systematize this in a sense that uh, we are discussing with Santa Fe College they are creating a documentary center of photography there. They are inviting me to come to participate a little bit with them and to bring this experience for the young photographers, to show how we photographed, how we, uh, we, we, we evolved inside the store, how we did the work prints, why you do this choice, not that one, and what other choice can we do? And uh, I'm planning probably to work a lot on this. Of course, that I will not stop to photograph. I continue to photograph, but uh, I believe that's the moment uh, to live, to start to live the place for younger. And that it's fabulous to see the replacement has come. Uh, I have so many young, I have a son, we have a son that uh, is doing documentary film, he's doing a video. 
And uh, he was in the school with a group of young uh, with him. And now we have two very good young photographers, about 26, 27 years old, that are in the road. They are shooting. They are going. It's fabulous to see a new generation come. And now I'm planning to see if I can contribute a little bit, to give a little bit what I did to explain to the others. And, uh, and uh, what I did to see if that can be useful in, in a sense. We have this project in Brazil that's taken a big part of our time. It's a project that we start in about 1991, when it's the land where I was born. We bought this land for my sister, for my father, with Lelia. We create a foundation. And that was very hard, because with all the products of the pictures that I sell for collection, that Americans bought so many of these pictures, of the copyright of this book, that we create this project. That we finance all the, 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 the project to replant the trees, the project of a school, and uh, the monitoring project. Uh, and we finance the first plantings. And uh, now we are having, we have about 300,000 trees that was planted. We built a school, we've just finished the built school, it was very hard to build the school. I made so many conferences. I applied for so much money around this world. The school is finished, we started the programs, we have a full community link with this project. For me, this is not the associate of photography. What I saw of, of what the uh, uh, distress around this world is very linked with distress in environment. And we are looking now not for just planted trees, not just for protect the monks or the crocodiles. We are trying to see if we can create one social ecology to see if uh, we can do a new proposition of a sustainable development in this area that we are working. And this is taking a big part of our life. And uh, you see, I'm 58 years old. If all things are going very well for me, I have 25 years of life in front of me. And when we look back, 25 years was yesterday. And uh, if uh, I, uh, I can put a little bit of my life, Leila can put for her life, the friends that are acting with us inside the project, probably in 25 years we can live at least this slice of land, more or less like we find when we came in dirt uh, 58 years ago. That means we be, uh, that is very quick, that's very, very fast. And I want to put a little bit of my time on this. And, and people, I, I won't tell you tomorrow, as can't tell, we'll be having a projection here. It's a film that we made with uh, Gene Robbins and, uh, and, uh, and John Berger. It's a discussion about uh, globalization. It's a full discussion about globalization. We are selling tickets, it's very expensive, I understand, $25. It's a lot of money to pay for a ticket to come inside, one thing like this. But with $25, we can plant and maintain during five years 80 trees. That means the people that will be paying to come here, they will be planting 80 trees with us. And I invite people to come because with Tides Foundation, we are organized this and the money that come in go directed to there. If you come tomorrow, I thank you very much because we'll be very nice on this. And, uh, and that is this, that is the life. This is a way of life we put all together. And uh, photography is not separate for the life. And, uh, and for me, it's, uh, it's, it's all this together. Well, <laughs> Maybe with that uh, uh, visionary commercial, uh, we will end and uh, urge you all, if you have not had a chance, to go over to the Berkeley Art Museum. And also, I might add, at the uh, Northgate Hall uh, at the Graduate School of Journalism, you will see uh, Sebastian's uh, photographs. So thank you so much for coming, Sebastian. Thank, thank you. you for coming. <laughs> <laughs>